The member writes as follows. Uh, Dear Rabbi Kellman, my daughter's almost four and started camp slash school about a year ago. She is very sensitive and would rather stay home with mom and baby, with mom and baby brother. She gives me a hard time to go every day and cries when I leave her. This summer, she's been crying more than usual to go and tells me, meaning she doesn't want to go, and tells me her stomach hurts. I send her four days a week. Would I be disrupting her routine and not allowing her to get used to a schedule if I would keep her home additional days when she seems more anxious? Is it normal for children to behave this way? How do my husband and I deal with the scared, crying fits, stomach aches, etc.? Thank you. Okay, uh, this is what I would call a five-star mom. She really cares, and she only wants to do what's good for her daughter. Um, and you deserve kudos for that. That's really, that's really special. In this generation, someone who cares about parenting is uh, not in the center of the bell curve. Let's put it that way. You're really special. Um, okay, so um, let's just start with, uh, with something which I think is probably not the central issue, but something that as responsible adults, we have to investigate. When, when a, a child starts complaining about stomach aches, so it might be anxiety. And from your description, it sounds like it probably is anxiety. However, because we're responsible people, it's probably worth checking. Unless you have concrete proof that there really is no stomach ache, like as soon as you tell her she can stay home, then immediately her stomach ache is gone. But if that's not the case, if, if even after you tell her she can stay home, the stomach ache persists, then it's probably worth taking her to a pediatrician just to confirm that there's nothing special going on. I was involved in a case, this is a long time ago, this is about 16, 17 years ago, and uh, the little girl complained about stomach aches and uh, didn't want to go to school and, you know, the whole routine. Sounds a little bit like what you're describing. Parents thought it was probably anxiety. And uh, they checked. And it turned out the little girl had celiac disease. And she was actually experiencing tremendous abdominal stress. And it would have been very dangerous had that not been discovered. So it could be, God forbid, it could be something serious. Perhaps it's nothing worth checking. Okay, now let's assume that you checked or you're sure that it's not really anything physical. And what we're dealing with is uh, a kid who just wants more attention from her mommy. So what then? So first I wanna just say that I, I wrote about this uh, back in 2001, I wrote, I wrote pretty extensively uh, and with a lot of footnotes in a book called To Kindle a Soul. In that book on page 101 through 127, there's a whole section on dealing with kids' apparently inordinate needs for attention and affection. Um, and I would recommend to anyone who's facing a child who's demanding uh, inordinate amounts of attention or affection that they carefully go through pages 101 through 127 in To Kindle a Soul. Okay, now let's, let's zoom back and analyze this picture. Rabbi Shlomo Volba, many years ago, taught that all creatures are born in a state where they're prepared to do their job, meaning that the essential function of the creature is in place at the time of birth. So when a foal is born, a baby horse is born, it's not too many minutes before he rolls over, gets up on his feet and starts to walk because horses are meant to walk and to gallop and they can do that from a very young age, within a few minutes. Uh, kittens are meant to hop and play and within a very short period of time, they're capable of doing that. And the same is true by snake slithering and all the different animals. When they're born, they're born mostly functional, relative to a human being. When human beings are born, to quote Revolba, they look like a block of wood. 
and they just lay there. And they can't do anything. They can't feed themselves. Uh, they can't clean themselves. They, they are completely incapacitated at the time of birth. And it takes many months before a child achieves any sort of independence. So Revolva said, anyone who steps back and looks at nature will be struck by this and realize that there is something strange going on with human beings. And Revolva's conclusion was that the purpose of gestation is to prepare the creature for its job. However, a human being cannot be prepared for its job spending nine months alone in the womb. And the reason is because the purpose of a human being is connection, is relationship. Like the, the Ibn Ezra writes on Dvarim Lamed Yudtes, on Deuteronomy 3019, commenting on the verse in the Torah that says, this is God speaking, God says, see that I've placed before you life and I am commanding you to love. So on that verse, I've placed before you life and I'm commanding you to love. The Ibn Ezra comments, what do we learn from here? Hachaim heim la'ava. That the purpose of human life is love. Or another way of saying that is, we are loving machines. We were created to engage in relationship. Okay, now if you hold that in mind, then so many things fall into place. Like Rav Chaim Vital, uh, the, 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 the famous Kabbalist, he was the, he was the right hand assistant to the Ari Zal. And he, he writes that the vast majority of a person's eternity is dependent on his relationship with his spouse. It explains that in, ultimately the relationship with your spouse is a measure of how competent you are at relationship generally. Because with strangers you can fake it, but your spouse sees you at all hours of the day in all different circumstances, and they know who you really are. And therefore, if that relationship is in shambles, that's an indication that one's, one's relationship ability is very, very weak. And the opposite is true. If you have an extraordinary marriage, you have a really happy spouse. So that indicates that in the most difficult, challenging, transparent, relationship that you've got in your life, you're doing well. And that is the best indicator of your eternity. Why? Because human beings are relationship creatures. That's our primary job. We're supposed to fall in love with God. We're supposed to fall in love with other people. And there's supposed to be a love also between the body and the soul. So we are relationship creatures and we are born to engage in relationships. That's the game of, of Olam Haza, of this world. And of course, if we're going to train at relationship, as I've often said, the only exercise for skiing is skiing. If I run up and down stairs, it'll get me into better shape. But on the first day out on the slopes, I'm still going to have pain. There will st I'll still walk away with achy muscles because running up and down stairs doesn't use exactly the same muscle groups in exactly the same way as skiing down a slope. You could ride a bike to train for skiing, but you're still going to be sore after the first day of skiing. The only way to not be sore after a day of skiing is to do a lot of skiing. The only exercise for being competent in a relationship is relationship, which means that's what we came to this world to do. We're here to engage in relationship. Okay, hold on to that idea for a second. Let's take one more step forward. When your daughter cries, we assume she's only doing that for attention. She just wants more attention from mommy. That's all. It's just attention. But once you understand that attention is what she needs in order to develop herself, to become who she is, to create her ability to engage in a relationship, then attention for a human being is like oxygen. Our, our spiritual survival depends on getting attention and being engaged with others. And of course, the more intimate the relationship, the more vital it is to our development. So when we say she's only doing that for attention, we should translate, that's like saying, 
She's only doing that because she needs oxygen. Okay, there we wouldn't say only. We'd say, oh, I understand. She's doing it because she needs oxygen. So now everything is in perspective. Giving her that relationship with her parents is crucial to her survival. It's crucial to her psychological and spiritual growth as a child. It will be the key element in helping her through her teenage years, as I'll touch on shortly. And ultimately, it's going to determine the quality of her marriage, her friendships, and eventually what kind of a parent she becomes, or if she even becomes a parent or gets married. I just want to say as an aside that uh, you can read a lot of books to try to get a handle on reality. And the Kindle of Soul has, I don't know, hundreds of footnotes to hundreds of studies. But there's nothing like experience. I'm always loath to take parenting advice from someone who hasn't raised kids from their earliest years all the way through adulthood. And today, I'm a grandfather. And I'm looking back on all of my kids' childhoods. And I listen to what my kids say. So I'm, I'm biased. They're my kids. But I hear from a lot of people, they're amazing human beings. They grew into amazing adults that are doing amazing things in their personal lives and in their professional life. And I've heard people ask my kids, and I've heard this from every single one of my kids, they've all been queried by friends of mine, by guests, people who meet them. And I've personally heard it. I'm not getting it secondhand. They say to our kids, what did parents do right? And every single one of my kids answers, oh, it was Camp Kellerman. Okay, now what was Camp Kellerman? We had no idea what we were doing at the time. It was, a, it was complete uh, 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 in, innocence, naivete on our part, and a gift of God. It was no brilliance. We had no idea what we tripped into. We had moved to Israel. Israeli society is in some ways rougher than American society. Our kids could handle the Israeli schools all year. During the summer, they wanted a break. And we did what all parents in Israel do, which is during the summers, we sent our kids away to summer camp. And when they were young, of course, it was a day camp. And our kids would come home crying, unhappy, despondent. They would beg us not to send them the next day. And we went through this for three or four years. And at a certain point, my wife said, why are we paying money to send our kids off to some place where they really don't want to be? And we know how to raise kids. Maybe we should open up our own summer camp. And that's what we did. We opened up a summer camp for our kids, just for our kids, and we called it Camp Kellerman. So all of our kids have said that Camp Kellerman was the single greatest influence in their personal development throughout their childhood. And that was after, for more than a dozen plus years, we sent our kids to the finest yeshivas and the finest base Yaakovs, right? They said more than all those experiences in school, more than their friends at school, more than any other factor they remember, it was the time that they got focused attention from their parents for an entire month. Sometimes it was longer. Sometimes it was six weeks. And it was just us and them. Okay, now, of course, I couldn't take off that whole time. So until the, the Ben Ismanim hit, I was learning in Kohl at the time. So until the Ben Ismanim hit, and my vacation time came, so my wife ran what she called Camp Kellerman Mini Session. And it was little things where she would take kids to the park one day, and then another day she would take them to the museum, and it, right, it was little tiny things that she would do just around Yerushalayim. And then when Big Camp Kellerman came and Abba came, then we would travel outside of Yerushalayim, and we'd go to the Tank Museum, and we'd go to Little Israel, and we'd do all sorts of activities together as a family. And that filled the kids up with the attention and the affection that they were missing all year because they were away from us at school. Okay, the result of that was that our kids became very brave, fearless, as a matter of fact, I would say, fearless to a, a fault where they have to be held back from doing things that are risky because fear won't stop them. Thank God they're all very mature and they have good intellects and their intellect stops them, but the, their bodies aren't afraid. And more than that, they developed enormous psychological resilience, which allowed them to go through some pretty rough times as adults. Some stuff that would, that would, that would rock you or me, it, that would really shake us up. And those kids 
went through these sorts of things when they were in their early 20s, their 30s, and they bounced back. They recovered. They were terrific. Right? Crises that would shake up any adult. If they were, if an adult was hit with these things, these kids, they, they suffered, they went through pain, and they bounced back and came back terrific. So they attribute all of that to the special time that they spent with Ima and Abba at Camp Kellerman. Okay, now, back to the theme I was speaking about. Something to keep in mind is that if a child learns from us that they can turn to us at age four, then that lesson gets internalized and they'll open up to us at age 14 or 15, which is so crucial because that's a time when all the hormones are let loose and the child is so confused and they're at such high risk and they can get themselves into so much trouble so easily. And what we really want is for them to turn to us and talk to us about the issues. And so many kids at that age learned early on that mom and dad are not available. And they're not holding it as an intellectual concept. It's a visceral truth for them. They've internalized at an early age that Ima and Abba, mommy and daddy, they are there to provide for, for our basic physical health. But in terms of actually being our best friends, they're not our best friends. When would that have developed? It can't develop while, while mom and dad are both working for a living and sending the kid off to, to school and then perhaps a daycare program after school. And there's just no time for that. But summertime is a time when we could develop that sort of connection. By the way, it's also true that we used to schedule, we didn't tell our kids this, but we scheduled uh, mommy days. Uh, my wife would determine when during the week it was convenient for her. And then she would, quote unquote, spontaneously tell a child, you know what, I want to keep you home today. So rather than waiting until the child was over the top and then reacting to that and saying, yes, if you're in crisis, you can stay home today. My wife would proactively keep them home, fill them up with the attention and the affection they needed. So they never got to the, to the point where the vase overflowed, where they spilled over with stress and they started crying and saying, I have a stomach ache, please don't send me. Um, we had these spontaneously planned uh, keep the kid home days and everyone, we rotated through all the kids and they, none of them knew the pattern when it was going to happen, but they all knew that every now and then mommy would just keep them home and then and and the child would just accompany mommy on whatever she was doing that day, which was like vitamin C for the soul. What I was going to tell you was that there, there are these amazing studies that have been done. And it's now it's, it's, it's really a, a, a giant literature that demonstrates connection between affection on one hand and the child's later altruistic behavior on the other. When we are affectionate with our kids, we produce altruistic behavior in them. And parallel to that, when we are attentive to our children's legitimate needs, that produces psychological resilience. It allows them to bounce back. So there are two separate things that we do, attention and affection, and they produce two separate results. Affection produces altruism. Attention produces psychological resilience, strength, internal strength. There were, there were these parallel studies that were done at the University of Wisconsin and Florida State that both concluded, quote, inadequate warmth, attention, and love, in a, inadequate from the child's perspective, is associated with aggressiveness, delinquency, later drug abuse, and serious criminality. I, I, I want to read to you an astounding quote from this joint study at the University of Wisconsin and Florida State. They said as follows. By the way, this is quoted into Kindle Soul, page 112. You can look it up. Quote, the relationship between parental rejection and various types of deviance remained robust after controlling for the effects of other family factors, such as control, organization, religiosity, and conflict. And the analysis of reciprocal effects suggests that the predominant causal flow is from parental rejection to adolescent deviance rather than from deviance to rejection, which means we definitely see an association between not being there for our kids when they need us and kids who are deviant. There's definitely an association. No one argues. The power of this particular study or these two studies was they showed a causal relationship that it's not that because the children are deviant, the parents decide, I don't want to spend time with the kid. It's the opposite. 
It's that because the parents don't spend time with the kids, the children end up becoming deviant in an astounding, uh, 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 an earth shattering piece of research. The psychologist Joan McCord demonstrated that she could actually predict future criminal behavior in children based on the amount of maternal affection subject received in their youth. McCord explains, quote, her predictions of adult criminality based on knowledge of home atmosphere were not only markedly more accurate than chance, they were also more accurate than predictions based on the individual's juvenile criminal records. Meaning that if you had a kid who had been arrested at age 8, 10, 12 for shoplifting, you would think that would be a great predictor of the child being a criminal later on in life. But a better predictor, they discovered, is how much time, attention, and affection the child received from the mother. Listen to this. Knowing only the amount of affection a child received, McCord predicted later criminal activity with 92.9% accuracy. So what's the other 7.1%? All the other factors in a child's life. All the other factors in a child's life, the bad friends, the bad teachers, right, economic difficulties, all that accounts for 7.1% of later criminality. But 92.9%, McCord said, can be predicted based on how much attention and affection the child gets from their parents. That is absolutely astounding. And once I know that, so then, I'm going to take attention and affection very, very seriously. I, 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 I used to travel, when I, when I left Cole and I went to work, I used to travel a lot. I traveled all over America uh, uh, teaching. And I would be gone a week at a time, sometimes two weeks at a time. Revolva told me every single time I went, and at that point I was traveling once a month, Revolva told me every single time I went, I should take one of my children with me. I said to him, Rebbe, that means every five weeks my kid is going to be out of school for a week or two. Revolba said, they'll learn much more spending time with you and they'll be much more spiritually healthy. A week or two with Abba on the road was far more beneficial to them than being one of 25 kids in a classroom. So I, I don't want to undermine the, the role of the school. The school is very, very important, but let's call a spade a spade. The psychological and spiritual health of our children depends on us giving them attention and affection. When a four-year-old is crying out to us saying, please, mommy, please, I need more. You have to imagine they're saying, I need more oxygen and I want to become everything that God put into me, but I can't without your help. I need you to take care of me. So the answer is, uh, if your children are in crisis, they're they have stomach aches already, it's over the top, certainly I would give them the attention and affection they need. Start up your only, own little private family camp and you know, at least during the summer give them your full attention and if that's possible and uh, during the year be proactive and have the kids spend time with Ema and with Abba, with mommy and with daddy uh, proactively before they go into crisis so they never actually get to a point where they're begging you, please, please don't send me to school. Copyright LawrenceKellerman.com. All rights reserved.